Well, I guess we should get started because we're going to try to cover 14.8 billion years. Times <laughs> You think we can do it, Tracy? I'm not entirely sure we can, but I like that thumbs up. I have faith in you, Henry. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, so we'll start with a prayer. Then we'll do just a little bit of housekeeping as we've been doing at the beginning of this, this class for a couple of weeks now. And then uh, we'll dive in. So for people who are new to the Episcopal tradition, do you know that we have a standard Episcopal call and response? When I say, or anybody says, the Lord be with you, you guys say, secret little trick, fun fact about the Episcopal church. Oftentimes, and this is an abuse, by the way, oftentimes when people want to get a crowd of Episcopal fans quiet, they will shout, the Lord be with you. <laughs> because then every, like, we're all like, sort of, and also with you. And then we wait for the prayer. And sometimes it's like, the mashed potatoes and the macaroni and cheese are in the buffet and the fried cheese. You know. <laughs> this is not a trick, though. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sin. And give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. So just a little bit of housekeeping about um, what we're about here, among other things in this class. We're um, welcoming new folks, people who want to join the church or transfer into the church. Um, into the fold. So this class is for anybody, but it's also for, for new folks. So if you are new to the Episcopal tradition and to Good Shepherd Church, a little review about how to become a member. So if you become interested in us and our fellowship, then becoming a member, if you're a Christian, a baptized Christian, is about the easiest thing you could possibly imagine. You give us your name, the date and place of your baptism, and we enter it into our membership book, then to be Episcopalians means we are in relationship with a bishop. So when our bishop comes and he comes to visit about once a year, we introduce new members to him in a service, and he receives new members into the church. Does that make sense? This is for folks who are baptized and in their baptism made a mature commitment. In other words, I think we talked about you, Barry, were baptized as an adult, right? So you chose that. It's also for folks who were baptized as babies in another denomination, Methodist, Lutheran, you know, whatever, and were confirmed in that denomination. Does that make sense? So because I was confirmed a Methodist, I was baptized as a baby, let's say this is fiction, I was a but say I was baptized as a baby in the Methodist church, then I confirmed those baptismal vows that were taken on my behalf for myself when I was 17. In that case, you would be received by the bishop into the Episcopal Church. This won't apply to any of you because there are no infants or people under the age of consent, as it were, in the room. But just to play out a little further, though, it won't apply to any of you. Episcopalians who are baptized as babies, when the bishop comes around and they're old enough, they're ready, they get confirmed similar to Methodist, Lutheran, and others, where they're confirming the vows that were made on their behalf, taking them for themselves. Does that, does that make sense? So we receive into the Episcopal Church any baptized Christian who <clears throat> made a mature commitment of their, to their faith in, in, by any, with any pastor in any other Christian denomination. We do not rebaptize anyone. In the Episcopal Church, we honor the baptisms of all the Christian denominations. We actually are kind of hardcore about it. We refuse to rebaptize anyone. Um, and that's our way of saying, no, one baptism, your baptism, wherever it was, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is completely legitimate. We're totally on board. Any questions about membership, joining the church? This is just, that, again, that little housekeeping spot before we get cranking. Yeah, if you're if you're new with us and you're joining online, if you could, in the chat, if you could send your name and your contact information, Amy will grab it. Amy Bridges is, is my wonderful um, 
helper on the tech side of things. So if you're new to the class and you're online, if you can, yeah, in the chat, give Amy your name and contact information. Good. All right. Um, so this is the day that we talk about church history. And the reason we talk about church history in, in a sort of confirmation or newcomer or Episcopal exploration class, however you want to call it, is because people wonder, and rightly so, how, how did this church come to be? Like, what's the story of this church? Um, and kind of the standard deal is to, for Episcopalians is to start talking about the Reformation and Martin Luther and the Pope and the 95 Theses, and then we talk about this divorce that happened with Henry VIII and, you know, go through the lineage. And that's all great, and it's all true, and it's all legit, and it's all a part of our story. Um, but what I think is maybe more informative or compelling on a deeper or different level is to situate our story within a much, much larger frame. So I like to start with the origins of the universe the so-called Big Bang. And even before that, I like to start with the Holy Trinity. So, Amy, will you share the screen? And for you guys, what she's going to share is that icon that's right in front of you. So if you'll share the Rublev, can y'all see that? Yeah, y'all can see the screen. And you just tell me when they can. Oh, actually, you need to share it for the room too, don't you? Yeah. Got it? Yeah, there we go. So this is um, this is an ancient icon of our, or I don't know how ancient it is, but it's an old icon of our Christian tradition by the iconographer whose name is Rublev. And this is actually a painting of three visitors to Abraham in the Old Testament, so in the Genesis narrative. When Abraham was visited by the Lord, the, the text says in Genesis that the Lord came to visit Abraham, and then the, the, the narrative immediately goes to talking about three visitors. This is one of the origins of our sense in the, narr the biblical narrative of the doctrine of the Trinity. So again, let me repeat it. The text says the Lord came to visit Abraham. And then the text quickly goes to talking about Abraham hosting three people. And so what we have grown to understand is that the way that our earliest ancestors could talk about God is as fundamentally relational. We had to personify God, right? Bring God into sort of persona to tell a story about him and to sort of wrap our finite minds around it. And the way, this fascinates the heck out of me. The way we talked about him in that early Genesis text was in three persons. So this icon is commonly referred to as a Trinitarian icon. Now, if you look at the person in the middle, who sort of looks like sitting behind the table or the altar, right? And then you look um, at the chalice or, or a sort of bowl of bread or whatever that is in front of them. Y'all all see that? Then look directly under that and what it looks like the front of the altar. And do you see that little uh, rectangular, that sort of dim rectangular? Well, historians think that um, there used to be originally a mirror there. They found little traces of glue on it. And so they think that there was a mirror there. We've lost our icon. Are the, are the folks on the screen still so see it? And so if you can imagine, an icon is something that you sit in front of, right? So if you can imagine sitting in front of that icon, you're looking at a mirror. So you sit in front of the icon and you behold the three, God who is three in one, this personified image of the Trinity, thank you. And then you're looking at yourself in the mirror. That, that makes sense? And so then you become, what I always say is, you then become the fourth person of the Trinity. 
Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, what we believe is that God is a trinity of relationships, an outpouring of the Father into the Son, into the Holy Spirit, into the Father, into the Son, into the Holy Spirit, this outpouring of self-giving love. And the, the ancients called it perichoresis, God who dances around the edge of the relationship, a God who is relational sort of dancing. And this is just poetry and imagery. And what happened in the beginning of creation is that there was an outpouring of the creative love of the Trinity into matter. That kind of make sense? Into manifestation. 14.8 billion years ago, we're going to try to run science and, and, and uh, biblical theology neck and neck or parallel to each other. 14.8 billion years ago, and our science friends, and we are friends, have done the math on that for us. The outpouring of the Holy Trinity was such that life exploded. The Big Bang. And you, you can leave it down there. That's good. The Big Bang. In the Episcopal tradition, you will most commonly find followers of Jesus who find an evolutionary schematic like the Big Bang to be very, very compelling. Great friend, this is fundamental to who we are, great friends with science. We believe that science and theology and biblical narrative are three different languages saying the same thing, or put another way, three different ways to say the same thing and, and just sort of different languages. Another way to put that, what the, what the Rublev is saying, you know, the Rublev is a piece of artwork that has a mirror in it and you, you sort of join in it in a meditative practice. I'm the fourth of the Trinity. So are you, and so are you, and so are you, and so are you. Another way to, to sort of put it is this. This is, a, this is a quilt that uh, a good friend of mine down in Athens, Tennessee, where I served for a long time, made for me. Um, and she, I don't think she made it as the Big Bang, but this is the Big Bang. I named it the Big Bang. Um, so in the middle of it is a, is a clipping from an altar cloth. In the middle of it is a little lamb. I don't know that you can see it from that far away. This hangs up in the office, so if you ever wanted to see it closer, you could come. In the middle of it is a cutting from an old altar cloth, and there's a little lamb. The Christ energy, the sun energy of the Holy Trinity, exploding into this big bang expression of life. So when we talk about church history, I don't know why in the world we start at 1517. Because 1517, when Martin Luther, is that right? Martin Luther pounded the 95 theses into that church door. I mean, that is like Johnny come lately. That was last weekend in the grand scheme of history. So if we're going to talk about church history, let's begin when God, who is Trinity, this, this infinite wheel of self-giving love poured out of the frame of Trinity, right? The frame of sort of God's selfhood into all creation, 14.8 billion years ago. Now, as I talk, um, you're going to think, oh, I studied in history and he's a billion years off. I will concede that every time. As I talk, when I get to the English Reformation and you think I've got a date or a not name wrong, I do. I will concede all of that. What I'm trying to do is give this broad stroke that is far more theology of uh, sort of historical precision and accuracy. All this science stuff, by the way, uh, and a lot of the history stuff, we're not really sure, give or take 500 million years. That, yeah. that, that sort of makes sense. But just know that, that my, my point will be not that pinpoint accuracy in any particular discipline or field, but, but the broad stroke. So we believe that... Um, but we have a sense that, I don't know if it's a belief, we have a sense that science has done good work. It's not a belief. Science has done and is doing good work. And something like the theory of the Big Bang happened something like 14 and a half, 15 billion years ago, and God sort of exploded life into life. 
then we find it compelling, a lot of us do, that the drive shaft of creation is evolution. And what evolution is, in my sort of poetic sense of things, is um, this sort of continuing spiral of ever increasing complexity. So simple things evolve and grow to be more complex things, whether it's life forms or thoughts or theology or story. It interests the heck out of me, theologically and practically as a Christian, that in the, in, in the, in the strictest sense of the history of life, and you can put church in, in the history of life, most of the time, by, by, by large, I think margins, has been utter silence. Lots and lots of seeming inactivity. So the Big Bang is 14.8 billion years ago. Who knows when the, how old the Earth is? 4.5 billion years old, give or take 500 billion years. 14.8 billion years, this whole thing kicks off. 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth is born. What in the world was happening for 10 billion years? Is that 10 billion years? Yeah, more or less. And was God not present? Sure, God was present. God is infinite being. It's God's infinite being that overflowed and kicked this whole thing off. God, however, is not in any way constrained by our sense of time. So what's 10 billion years to me? God knows what that is to God. No pun intended. I mean, literally, God, God, sheer silence. And to me, what that does for me is I love the majesty and the mystery of it. But I also love the, the length of it because I get worked up and worried about an hour on a Thursday afternoon or 15 minutes in traffic on a Monday morning or seven minutes when I'm late to get one of the girls to school. Does that kind of make sense? Does anybody identify with that? Like these tiny periods of time give me heartburn. <laughs> Y'all for 10 billion years. Well, centering prayer? I mean, I, like, isn't that beautiful? Like dial it back. So 3.5 billion years ago, communities of bacteria formed on planet Earth. Fossil records are such that we know, give or take a few million years, 3.5 billion years ago, communities of bacteria are formed on planet Earth. It's pretty quiet for a billion years again. Or not again, but a billion years, 4.5 to 3.5. I love this one. On planet Earth, 1.8 billion. So you got these communities of bacteria that are just doing whatever communities of bacteria do. There's, you know. So 1.8 billion years ago to 800 million years ago is what science. I love this. Is what scientists call the billion or the boring billion. It was a billion years. 1.8 billion years ago to 800 million years ago. It was a billion years where scientists say. Nothing much happened on planet Earth. I couldn't get the ice off of my windshield this morning because I thought, David, 20 minutes would be plenty for my truck to warm up and get the ice to melt. I was like, couldn't have been more wrong. I was, did you? I was like fundamentally totally dead wrong. So it took me 20 minutes to clean the ice off of my windshield, which meant I was skating into work. So like, like this seven minute margin again, like I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna be, like I've never been late to church. I've been for a billion years. Nothing is happening on planet Earth. Such that these serious scientists, I love it, call it the boring billion. 540 million years ago, anybody know? Is what we refer to as the Cambrian explosion. So 540 million years ago on planet Earth is what we refer to as the Cambrian explosion. This is where in the fossil records, 
we find the largest major groups of animals um, yet in the, in the history of the 4.5 billion year history of planet Earth. Does that make sense? 252 million years ago, so those, those animals apparently are doing their thing. And then 250 million years ago, we have a great dying off event on planet Earth, a big extinction. Started. 65 million years ago, we have the big event. Is it an asteroid or what? Pick your theory, right? But we're pretty, pretty clear on the date. 65 million years ago, we have the big event that kills off the dinosaurs. So when I'm a little boy and I'm studying the dinosaurs and I'm totally fascinated by them, they seem like all of prehistory history to me. Like they seem like, every, like, like just everything that's old beyond sort of, or before humans is like dinosaurs. But what science is telling us, what our archeologist friends are telling us is the dinosaurs were like a tiny piece, a tiny piece of the history of our planet, much less the history of the known universe. So five to seven million years ago, are we together? So we're really getting close to current day, aren't we? Compared to 4.8 billion? Five to seven million years ago, the earliest ancestors of human beings appear. So these would be, forgive me, forgive me, I am not a scientist, you can, all I'd want to do is make you curious. You go study any of these things like I do in depth for yourself. But so we're, what we're talking about here is our, our, our sort of ape-like ancestors. Does that make sense? Five to seven million years ago. We got to wait almost five, six million years. 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens arrived on the scene. 300,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago, now we get really close, civilizations began to emerge on planet Earth. You remember what caused civilizations to emerge? The advent of agriculture and trade. 6,000 years ago. <laughs> Let's see, about Three to 4,000 years ago, the events of the old that are recorded in the Old Testament begin to happen. Three to 4,000 years ago, the events that were recorded in the Old Testament begin to happen. 1,200 years ago, those events are written down. And those events that we have in the Old Testament in our, in our Bible are written down, recorded, gathered for about a thousand years. We're not real sure when the first five books of the Old Testament, so-called Torah, Pentateuch, and the Old Testament itself was gathered, but record was a sort of final list or canonized, we say, but recorded, passed around on school, scrolls for a thousand years from about 1,200 to about 165, something like that, BC. So within that period of time, so three to 4,000 years ago, human beings all over the planet, wherever there are populations of human beings, of course, begin to organize themselves in tribes. And every tribe has a different God. You can kind of think back to what we talked about last week with spiral dynamics. I'm not going to reteach spiral dynamics, but if you can kind of let that inform this. So every tribe has a God. Every tribe in the earliest days of it has a sort of a belief system. And purple stage spiral dynamics has sort of a, a magical kind of a thinking. What happens 3,000 years ago, give or take, is an evolutionary in human consciousness where we realize that the way we are living is too what? Violent and arbitrary because sometimes when there's a full moon the cow dies but sometimes when there's a full moon the cow gives birth. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So our magical thinking which worked for us until we really got a little more rational thought or consciousness online begins to fall apart. 
So 3,000 years ago, what we call in spiral dynamics, blue or traditional stage comes online and it is the advent for the first time in human consciousness of monotheism. This is the beginning of the great world religions. The one we focus on is Judaism. Does that make sense? This is God and Abraham, you know, Father Abraham and the Old Testament narrative. This is God and Abraham making a covenant with each other. You and, and, every, and God and everybody else, by the way. You will be my people and I will be your God. This is God relating one-to-one -one with Moses, burning bush. This is God hearing the cries of, of the Hebrew people who were enslaved and captured in Egypt. This is, this is human consciousness locating all their hopes and, and lodging all of their laments in the lap of one true God. This is the birth in human history of Yahweh, Jehovah, the God who we know is true. Who started this thing all off 14.8 billion years ago. <clears throat> About five, six, seven hundred BC, the children of God grow dissatisfied with just having this sort of fellowship with God because they look around at their neighbors talking about the Hebrew people, the Hebrew people look around at their neighbors and they see that all of their neighbors have a king. Good. Who's, yes, king. Yes, good. Have a king. And they tell God they want a king. And God says, you don't want a king because then mission and power will get all tangled up. Your king will take all your stuff. It'll become colonial. You don't want a king. And the people said, we want a king. Give us a king. And God, ever the indulgent parent says, I'll give you a king. It doesn't go well. We won't retell the whole history of, of all of that, but suffice it to say that the people of God get their religion mixed up with power, empire, along the way, colonialism, and it doesn't go well, but you have the birth in the midst of all of that of the, of the church. In Old Testament parlance, it's called temple life. And then out, uh, sort of uh, satellite to the temple where the was synagogue life, right? The local church and the local cities. And we get organized. We have structure. We have hierarchy. We have different people who, who do different things. And we become powerful. And the way in the early church we govern ourselves primarily is through the law. And there's 600 some odd laws, the chief of which are the Ten Commandments, right? This is organizational structure. This is church life. 2,000 years ago, pretty big thing happens in the life in the history of the uh, Christian church. A little baby is born to a young girl and a man in a manger in Bethlehem. Jesus of Nazareth is born. We would say zero just to be clean about it. You know, the zero zero. But I don't even, I never have been able to understand that's a thing. But really, three to four CE, common era, AD, however you want to put it. Um, Jesus is born. It's important to know for the historical timeline that Jesus is born in the Roman Empire. So he's born into a context in which there is a secular authority that has a lot of muscle, a lot of strength. Y'all know the gospel story. Jesus goes about preaching and teaching in this morning's gospel. He calls his first disciples. He's fundamentally about two things, making friends with everybody around him. The Sermon on the Mount refuses to other Anybody? Does that make sense? When Jesus says, love your enemies and love people who are hard to love, and when he goes to Samaritan women who would be outsiders, when he touches lepers, the point where he touches a dead body, you know, which was a no-no, he refuses to other anybody. That is, make somebody an outsider or an other. He's got this, this vast ethic of love, and that is a threat to power. It's a threat to the established church, which has governed itself by laws, rules. And here comes this guy who breaks all the rules. One of them is you're not supposed to touch a dead body, and he can't quit doing it. And much less, when he touches them, they rise to life again. Like, stop it. You're messing with the structure here. So this is the first sort of, um, uh, well, I, I guess it's not the first. It's not the first. It's a continuing uh, 
is Jesus is continuing in a line of people who disrupt the status quo. So the church from here on forward is going to be um, peopled with prophetic voices that when church gets power, people get sort of stayed in uh, status quo, someone's going to come and disrupt it. This is the essence of uh, this sort of stretch of church history. So the disciples are called by Jesus. They start to form little house churches. They, they sort of travel around, go hiking, go sailing, go whatever, and talk about Jesus and the gospel, which is a word that means good news, uh, wherever they go. And people are attracted to this message, and they start to form these little, little enclaves of Christian fellowship. So for the first, let's see, let's think about this. For the first three centuries of, you know, so 2,000 years ago, for the first three centuries of the common era, the church is in the earliest days characterized by growth and then quickly characterized by persecution and heresy. So persecution, why? I've already said it. We're a threat to power. Um, Jesus was a threat to power. People who um, will break rules for the cause of love are a threat to law and order. So therefore, we are persecuted. Oh, and by the way, the Roman Empire is set up such that you really should, should worship the emperor. Does that make sense? So that's a real conflict there. Heresies, characterized by persecutions on that side, characterized by heresies, because as we organize in larger and larger groups, people are disagreeing about what we believe. What, as, as Christians, as early followers of Jesus, disagreement about what we believe. Does that sound at all contemporary? I mean, that has just never stopped. Yeah. So it comes to a head in church history, these first several centuries of persecution and heresy, with three important things in the life of the early or ancient church, we call it, that draw us together and that still have us together. One is the collection of the New Testament canon. There is, I wrote this down because there's a, yeah. So by the year 250, there was a basic outline of the New Testament, the books of the New Testament. Do y'all know when I call it the New Testament canon? That's what that means. It's, canon means just a basic listing of the books that are accepted by the wider church. So in the year 250, there's a, a basic outline of the New Testament canon, the four gospels and, and some of the letters. We do not have a list of the New Testament books in the Bible that matches our own until the year 367. Does that make sense? So almost 400, going on 400 years after the birth of Jesus. It takes us almost four centuries to get a good list of the New Testament canon. That's what we still have today. Okay, so I said three things that we do in response to persecution and heresy. One is the New Testament canon is established. Two, the Apostles' Creed is developed. The Apostles' Creed is the ancient baptismal creed of the church. It's, the, it's like the bare bones, the beautiful bare bones of what we believe doctrinally, or not doctrinally, creedally as Christians. The Apostles' Creed is what we have in our prayer book today in kind of question and answer form in our baptismal service. It also shows up in uh, the morning prayer service, which I love because that's, y'all, that's 1,700 years old, but it's right here in this book that was approved for use in 1979. The third thing we did is develop a thing called apostolic succession, and what that, what that, that means a number of different things, and there's a whole world of sort of um, uh, study on apostolic succession, but the essence of what it means is Christians need to be able to trace their beliefs and their practices back to the original teachings of the apostles of Jesus and unto Jesus himself. So in the earliest centuries, those were the three things that kind of gathered us together and were a glue that held us together in the midst of great persecution and widespread heresies. Because every, every snake oil salesman um, in every city was kind of coming up, I've got a new version of Christianity for you. Know, so so we got these three things to get us sort of <clears throat> a little bit of cohesion. And this is very important. In the earliest centuries of the Christian church, the focus was on resurrection. Hell comes much later. 
our focus on sin and depravity and repentance and the punishing God comes much later. The early days were about Jesus rescuing people from the grips of darkness, all about resurrection. The Eucharist was a celebration, not a sacrifice. By the end of the second century, the three orders of the tripartite orders of ministry, in those days it was deacons, elders, and bishops. We in the Episcopal tradition, we would say deacons, priests, and bishops, lots of synonyms there. Into the second century, that order, those orders of ministry are established and in place. Persecutions in the early church begin to come to an end, though they not but they though they do not end in the year 313 with the Edict of Milan, which was not making Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. It was quelling the persecution. It was actually an edict that provided for tolerance for religions with a special emphasis on Christianity because the emperor at the time, Constantine, liked what we were doing. In 325, you've got another creed the Nicene Creed is developed, and by the end of the fourth century, you've got the doctrine of the Trinity, which a, a group of people that we all owe a great debt to called the Cappadocian fa Fathers, again, you can do a deep dive into the Cappadocians, gave us, after they did a lot of work on it, and it established God as fundamentally relational. God is self-giving love, being itself, constantly pouring God's self into the Father, into the Son, into the Holy Spirit, and then constantly overflowing into the fourth person of the Trinity, which is all of us and all creation. The, the original fourth person of the Trinity is right here in this sort of icon, this quilt and iconography, creation itself. What we've come to believe, and this started in the earliest days, is that we are not um, creatures of a clockmaker God, a God that sort of created us, sort of wound the clock that is David, and wound the clock that is Henry, and then just, you know, sort of set us off. Rather, we believe in a fully engaging, infinitely relational God who is constantly pouring us into creation in every moment of our existence. So you are animate to life in this moment because God is pouring you to an exist into existence out of God's love right this second. Should he stop? So somebody say, hey, David and Henry have had their run. God, stop pouring them into existence. We would disappear from your eyes. How cool is that? Not that we would disappear, but that we're, we're living right now because creation is ongoing. In the year 380, the persecutions really begin to come to an end because, and it actually wasn't Constantine. It was the, it was the guy after him. Um, in the year 380, Christianity is made the official religion of the state, of the, of the empire, as it were, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, my teacher, Father Richard Rohr, who's a Franciscan priest teaching uh, today in, in New Mexico, so he's a, he's a good Roman Catholic, right? Um, he always says, oh, we missed on the name because Catholic, lowercase c, Catholic, means universal. So the Catholic religion of Christianity means universal, means everybody's in, like take the doors off the hinges. Everybody's in, Jews, Gentiles, everybody's in. He says, but we went just a one step further. I don't know what it was. He says, the ego or what, went into the Roman Catholic Church, which is paradoxical, oxymoronic, contradictory, whatever it is, I don't know, but it's, it's a particular word, Roman, right? That's a particular tribal word, bunched up with a word that literally means universal. I'm not picking on our Roman Catholic siblings. We, we love them, I love them, got a lot of great friends there, but it is kind of a funny thing that they did. So we become the official, Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire in 380, and just a little while later, Rome falls. Rome is sacked, I think it's 410, in the 5th century, so around, around that time, the entire biblical canon is complete. And to me, this is sort of a big 
a big axial point or shifting point or watershed in the life of the church. We got ourselves poured into existence. We got ourselves evolved into human beings. We have a consciousness. We got ourselves organized in civilization. We got ourselves moving about. We got ourselves in bed with power. We got ourselves persecuted because of that. Then we got ourselves out of persecution by really befriending power and becoming the official religion of the state. And then the state, and we really owe a lot to them, I think. I don't want to completely hate on the state at this point. False. I'm not going to take you through it all. Um, some of you are better qualified. I know Woody is as a history teacher to do it than I. But you have this invasion of the Germanic cultures into the, into the West, and Rome is sacked. And you know what humans love to do. We love to fight and carry on and compete and, and steal each other's stuff. So for the fifth and sixth centuries, there's just an awful lot of that going on. And the world is full and the church is full of disorder and pain and death. And the focus begins to shift from resurrection, sin, and repentance. And uh, how do we save ourselves from punishment in the afterlife? So it really is a, a sort of a sad turn in the life of the church. The church in the West is in great disarray because of the, the invasion of the Germanic cultures. The church in the East to the West is England, Italy, France, that sort of, the church in the East is, you know, what we refer to as East now, Byzantine, right? Sort of just go East on your, on your globe, is not as affected, not as rocked by all of the invasions as the West is. So they've got a little more breathing room in the East and good thing because in the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries, the church in the East does a lot of important work around, here's an awful church word, but not awful, but a clumsy one, Christological issues. So one of the things that we need to develop as a church in the early days, or sort of, what is this, preteen days, is who in the heck Jesus Christ is theologically. And there's a great argument that goes on for centuries and the landing place is that what we believe today, which is Jesus is fully human and fully divine. He's not Superman. He's not God come to visit us and miraculously lived it through death. He is as fully human as we are, and he's as fully as divine as God is. That's two full measures put on top of each other. It's an impossibility for our minds to wrap it around, but wrap around, but theologically, that's what we believe. That development came out of the ecumenical councils of the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries in the East. I'm going to fast forward a few hundred years. If you're really interested in the Middle Ages and the High Middle Ages, lots of books for you to read. But I've got just a short period of time to cover another thousand years. In 1098, something very big happens. The year 1098, Anselm, now, now St. Anselm, then just Anselm, the bishop, comes up with the substitutionary atonement theory. Substitutionary atonement theory. And if your eyes are starting to glaze over because you don't think you know what I'm talking about, you do know what I'm talking about because our church, not this one, but the contemporary Christian church was built on it, and I am not happy about it. <laughs> Substitutionary atonement theory arose a thousand years ago because folks, and Anselm was just the archetype or the spokesperson, couldn't think of a rational reason why Jesus, God let Jesus die on the cross. That makes sense? If this guy is fully human, fully divine, if so he's the second person of the Holy Trinity, what in the heck is it with the cross? Why did he die on the cross? Why did God let him? Why did he seem to go down like sort of willingly in a sort of a way? Well, Anselm came up with this theory, substitutionary atonement. He said the only rational reason for Jesus to die on the cross is because we are fundamentally bad. We're sinful people, and we've done a lot of egregious, terrible things. And the people kind of look at the record of their own history and are like, well, that's, that's actually true. We have done a lot of terrible things. You know, newsflash, we all have. I mean, anyone can look at their record and be like, 
yeah, I've had a few low spots in the, the story that is my life. Well, they just went with it um, to the furthest extent. It said, we're really bad. God's really unhappy with us. God wants to kill us. But instead, he gave his son as a substitute for our punishment. So God killed God's son instead of killing Charmaine and David and Henry. And just to make sure you know it, Charmaine and David and Henry deserve to be killed. So that doubles down on our guilt, right? This is substitutionary atonement theory. It comes a thousand years ago out of the pen of Anselm, and it changes everything. What we missed was the T word. It was a theory. <laughs> it's still a theory. And for some people, it's a very helpful theory that saves their sense of self and gives them equanimity in their life. And I say, if it makes you more loving, go with it. But know this, it's a theory. And for a lot of us, it is not compelling. And it doesn't serve to make me more loving to think that my God hates me. But for the substitution of his son on the cross. But it sells and it gets some wheels and some momentum. And the Middle Ages are full of the strength that it gives the church. Because if people buy that, that situates, situates the power in the church. And I've got the keys to the kingdom, and I can teach you what you need to say so that you don't go to hell. So the Middle Ages are this great swath of, of centuries where both the church and the state are tangled up together, um, shearing and, and fighting alternately over power and um, spreading, spreading, spreading. You have the growth of cities. You have the construction of cathedrals, and you have the height of the papacy, the power of the Pope, who's just an archetypal figurehead in the church. You have a real low point, not long after Anselm and substitutionary atonement theory in uh, 1098, or right, right along with it, the first crusades are in 1095. I'm not going to tell the story of the crusades. You, you all probably know them, and they're awful. That's us at our worst. Here's what fascinates me. At the same time, within 100 years-ish, you have people like St. Francis of Assisi coming over the scene. So at the same time that we're at our worst, God is still creating and causing people to arrive in our midst, to have the love ethic in the marrow of their bones. St. Francis of Assisi was our, is our famous um, friend who was born into great privilege, renounced all of his privilege, and hit the road um, for the cause of the sick and the poor and, and the destitute. In 1347, you have the Great Plague, the bubonic plague, and this causes a real crisis for the church. You know why? Because the church couldn't protect the people from the plague. The church could not protect the people I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people from dying, right? So the church had said it, it had all the answers and all the power, and the plague sort of, the emperor has no clothes. You cannot protect us from this thing. Not long after the bubonic plague comes and tells us the truth about where power lies, um, Reform, it becomes clearer and clearer that reform in the Christian church is needed. Um, we've really taken power and run with it. And things like substitutionary atonement theory are now manifesting as things like indulgences. And you've got to pay the church uh, to get into heaven when you when you die. You know, you've got to pay the church for favor. And we have this real growing sense. That it's people who do good works and show favor to people in power who are recipients of God's grace. Does that, does that kind of make sense? And so this is what gives rise to the Reformation. Martin Luther's great intuition was that it's faith through grace that affects salvation, not works. 
not being in favor with the powers that be. But faith. And so in 1517, he's had enough of the abuse of what is his perception, and, and he's, he's right, is, is a, uh, abuses of the church. The Roman Catholic Church is the biggest game in town. And he nails the 95 theses to the to the Wittenberg, Wittenberg. Wittenberg to, the, to the door of Wittenberg. And that is the um, that is what we largely, in a broad stroke, say is the beginning of the Reformation. Now, when you do it, your own deep dive into Reformation history, you'll see that it was actually starting at just lots of boiling over well before that, but that's the symbolic sort of start of it. So this is, if you're looking at a, at a tree, like a, like a family tree of the Christian church, you got a couple of splits. You have one that I didn't talk about in 1054. I think it's 1054. But the big split that we're all sort of heirs of today is the Reformation. So the early 16th century, where all the Christian denominations, probably for the most part, that we're familiar with, split off from the Roman Catholic tradition in what we commonly refer to as the English or the Protestant Reformation. I guess Protestant Reformation is the big umbrella term. So what's, what happens in the, in the Reformation is kind of geographically sort of two, two halves of it. You've got what we refer to as the Reformation on the continent. And that's, um, the, I mean, just by population, that's the largest part of the Protestant Reformation, right? Um, so you've got Calvinism, you've got Lutheran, you've got Zwingli, you've got all of this stuff happening over on the continent. And you can do a deep dive there. I'm not going to because we're Episcopalians. And what the other half of the Reformation, as I sort of split it up in my little head, is happening in England. That's where we come from. So we often say that um, <laughs> the Episcopal Church was born out of a divorce. And it was, in part. In England, Henry VIII was the king, and he was a solid Roman Catholic, but he wanted to get a divorce because he was not able to produce a male heir. The Pope would not let him get a divorce. He asked, and the Pope said no. I bet he regretted that. He probably thought, I should have, I should have, instead of asking for permission, I should have apologized later, but he did ask for permission, and the Pope said no, and Henry VIII said, that's no problem. I'll make myself the head of the church in my kingdom. And so this is a broad stroke. He did. This is how we get this sort of technically uh, the, the, the church in, a, in the broadest stroke, the Church of England. Henry VIII does not affect a lot of reforms. He doesn't really care all that much. Sorry, but that's the crash reality. He doesn't really care all that much. He just wanted the power. Nevertheless, some reforms do begin. So when people say to me, hey, Henry, your, your church just started over sex and a divorce, I'll say that was the particular thing that sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. But the truth is, Reformation had been happening for probably 100 years, the, the energy of it. It happened on the continent. It was coming across the channel one way or another. This is just the particular event. That, that kicked it off, which if you think about it, it's kind of how life happens. The stage is set, but then something sort of egregious has to sort of break it all apart. So Henry VIII wants to have an heir, he can't, he gets divorced. He ends up having a son, um, Henry, I mean, Edward VI. Edward VI is too young to rule, so his council of re regents affect a lot of Protestant reforms. Person that follows Edward VI is Mary. We call her Bloody Mary, she is a Roman Catholic, which is bad for business in the Protestant Reformation. She, she doesn't have a very long reign, does she? The four, five, I was close. Um, Woody's my history teacher. Uh, he's great at doing this. I'll get a great after. Uh, so Mary undid, she spent a lot of her time undoing the reforms and killing people. Elizabeth is our hero. Elizabeth follows her. Elizabeth is the daughter of Anne Boleyn, correct? So the person that, that Henry married was Anne Boleyn, right? Now he falls out, of, they fall out of favor, and she gets herself killed. But it's kind of a neat poetic twist, isn't it, that Elizabeth is the daughter of Anne Boleyn. 
And Elizabeth was a Protestant. And during her long reign, Queen Elizabeth, the, the Church of England grows roots and it blooms. And what's characteristic about the Church of England is characteristic about the Episcopal Church. I'm going to go five minutes over. The Church of England did not go in on 100% of the Protestant Reformation. The Church of England adopted an enormous amount of the Protestant theology, but kept the Catholic ancient traditions of worship and governance. Does that make sense? And what developed out of that is what we call the Via Media, the Anglican way which means that whenever you find a, uh, an Episcopalian, and I'm going to get us to the Episcopal Church in the United States in just a second, you're going to find someone who is faithfully and rationally, using reason, shooting the gap. So where my more Protestant brothers and sisters view the Eucharist, this is just an example, view the Eucharist as a dramatic reenactment of the Last Supper scene in the Gospels. And my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters view it as something more akin to transubstantiation, where the, the wine and the bread are literally turned into flesh and blood, let's say. And these are broad strokes. I'm not poking fun at either of them. I adore them both. Episcopalians or Anglicans are the middle way via media. So we believe, we sort of gather them both up in this embrace and say, the spirit the, the real presence of the Christ in the Eucharist is spiritual. And the reenactment of the drama is infinite. That's that kind of and and we and we shoot shoot the gap. We're all on board with a broad stroke. Can you hear me, Tracy? We back, yeah. So I'm saying there's not a more Episcopal sentence than the Bible contains all things necessary for salvation. All right. So how did we get here? So the Reformation happens in, in England and beyond. And the Church of England is born, and worldwide they're called Anglicans. And as you know, Europeans went out on conquesting missions to find what they perceived to be new lands. They weren't, of course, new lands because there were people already there, but they came to the Americas. Europeans came to the Americas. Uh, when I was learning about it as a little kid, we called it colonists and colonies. Um, and they brought, the simplest way to put it is they brought their religion with them. Does that make sense? So they, they brought the Church of England here. A large group of the founding fathers of our country were members of the Church of England. And they didn't like being controlled by the king for the founding of the secular part of our culture. Neither did they like being controlled by the bishops in the Church of England and the religious part of our culture. So the people who framed our country framed the Episcopal Church. And they built the Episcopal Church on a governance model that is darn near a mirror image of the United States governmental structure. So you have lay people, which is you all, you have priests and deacons, which is me and deacons, and you have bishops. And in our organizational structure, lay people and um, priests and deacons make up the House of Deputies, which is similar to the House of Representatives. And bishops make up the House of Bishops, which is very similar to the Senate in the secular governmental structure. And at the top of it, we have a presiding bishop Ours is very famous. His name is Michael Curry. He's famous because he was the preacher at the royal wedding of Harry and Meg. Is that right? Did I get that right? Um, it's the first African-American presiding bishop of our Episcopal Church in the United States, uh, akin to 
the president. Again, so it's kind of a, a loose parallel, but a parallel nonetheless. So the broad stroke, and it's it's um, it's not as extensive as it be, but I'm trying to pique your interest, not give you the deepest of dives, is that the Church of England in the United States of America is the Episcopal Church. And we grew ourselves up and out of our family of origin, England, just like um, the framers of the Constitution and the creators of the secular culture did. What characterizes the Anglican communion all over the world, and there's about 80 million all over the world, and more specifically, what characterizes the Episcopal Church in the United States is that we're the Christian community. We're a Christian community that is always pushing out on the cutting edge of including more people in our fellowship. And we do that because we believe that the one who exploded life into life 14.8 billion years ago has for the entirety of human history been trying to open the doors of his own heart to every living thing. So the way we Episcopalians express that is that we create an argument at every turn for welcoming more members of creation, if I can put it just kind of poetically, into the fold. So you'll find that we were early in on full inclusion of people of color. We were um, early in, not as early as we should have been, on, on uh, women in leadership. Um, we we're early in on the inclusion of, of gay people and, and uh, ordained ministries and, and the offices of bishop. We're always trying to see how we can widen our embrace. And I have a sense that just as evolution seems to be this spiral of ever increasing complexity um, our ethos and the way we do theology is the same and it's it's a it's a complexity that we lean into that is paradoxically grounded in a sheer simplicity and i think that sheer simplicity is expressed in the gospel that's appointed for today where Peter comes to Jesus and says, man, you don't want anything to do with me. I am a hot mess. And Jesus said, I don't care any, about any of that. Let's walk together. We're friends. At the end of the gospel, when Jesus is saying goodbye, he says to his disciples, I'm going to leave you with this one command. I want you to love each other as I loved you. That love is generative. It will make friends everywhere it goes. He says that. He says, I'm not calling you servants. Y'all don't work for me. He says, you're my friends. And no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. So go, create, be a part of the growth of all creation. It'll never end 14.8 million years ago. It started off, make friends. So what will the next millennia of church history be? Hopefully, the hard work, making more friends. All grounded in those long stretches of billion-year silence. How cool is that? So... David Cooper, I didn't do it. I'm probably seven minutes over, but that was church history from the Big Bang to now. Thanks for entertaining. Wow. 65 minutes. Yeah. So if you have any, any questions briefly, I've got a few minutes before I need to go up to worship, but otherwise, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Wow.
Did it work? It worked. Cool, cool. That's, yeah, that's a fun one. You guys on the screen, if you have any questions, I have just a few minutes. I'm, I'm not sure that I have any answers, but just a few minutes and I'm going to head up to worship. Otherwise, it's good to be with you. I need to go up and have something for you. Good. Thank you, Alan. I'm the usher. You're the usher. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, not going back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just more about the ritual. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I've got. I brought my library just to just to say. So I think this is a. I think this is a great book on the Episcopal Church. Um, and this is a great primer. And you're welcome. Yeah, to write down these titles. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. I did not know about that part of the government. I was thinking the same thing. But... And the Episcopal Church. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, yeah. And we're organized the same way too. Um, it, it it goes down all the way to the local level. So we have the equivalents of states in the Episcopal Church. The states are called dioceses. Again, we use these kind of clunky church words, but that's okay. The states would be the equivalent of diocese. The local bishop would be the equivalent of, the, of a governor, let's say. And then within the diocese, we have parishes, what, which might be equivalent to a city. I might be equivalent to a mayor, right? And then we have a vestry, which might be equivalent to a city council or something like that. So it really is very rationally organized all the way, all the way down to the, to the street level. Um, we, we have... Uh, uh, regions, so many dioceses make up a region uh, called a province in the Episcopal Church, and the provinces, this is this is a little silly, but the provinces are like the SEC, the Big Ten, the Pac-10, I mean, they're like these bigger, we don't really have the a province in our governmental structure, but we do organize ourselves in other areas of life in the bigger sections of and then the general convention of our church is a meeting of the church every, of the big, huge national church every three years. That's akin to sessions of Congress, though Congress obviously meets far more often than three years. But praise Jesus, we do not meet more often than three years because we do not need to, we do not need to mirror them and their sort of minutia, with all due respect. Um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty, but once you, once you, I think once you know that that's the, that's the mirroring, then it's pretty easy to sort of decipher yeah. the hierarchy. So how does that happen that it mirrors the government? Is it like for the people in politics? Tommy, I mean, yeah. Um, also Woody like, could, could tell us better, but was Thomas Jefferson at Church of England? I mean, I don't know if Jefferson was, but a lot of founding. Well, formerly he was. He was actually what's called a deist, but he was formerly a member of the church. So a lot of the founding fathers, excuse the section of slang, the fathers of the, of the country, were were um, members of the Church of England, so they brought they the organization. They brought the organizational structure, but there's also a, another important point: the Anglican tradition adopted, as I said, the, the theology of the Protestant Reformation. So it's no longer works righteousness; it's faith through grace alone, which we're all in on. today. I'm all in on that, but they kept the governance of the ancient church, and they kept the worship tradition of the ancient church. Which is why in contemporary dress, I look like a Roman Catholic priest because my tradition, the Episcopal tradition, kept that ancient um, worship tradition. Our service looks very familiar to, to, to a Roman Catholic because we, we kept all the candles and the altar, the altar of linens. We kept the governance too. You remember I said by the year 250, the tripartite order of ministry was in place, bishops, elders, and deacons. And then that that stayed and flourished into the Roman Catholic tradition. A lot of the Protestant reformers were so disenchanted with the governance structure and the abuses of power that they said, get rid of it all. Unto some of our Protestant brothers and sisters having only local authority, what we call congregationalism. We just weren't that for, for probably reasons that are good and probably reasons that are not so good. We just were not that scared of the governance structure. What I suspect is what we found is that it was a usable, workable system 
if you could just get the abuse out there. Does that kind of make sense? So kind of like not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, so we, we just kept the governance structure of, of bishops. Now, in our least creative moment, we named our church the Episcopal Church. And Episcopal is an English word that comes from a Greek word that means bishop. So it's just, it's, you know, it's a lovely word. I think I said this. It's a lovely word, but there's a reason for it. It's just kind of silly, but it, it's okay. Um, what I like about the, the, the structure of the Episcopal Church and our bishops is that a bishop is a living symbol. A bishop does not exercise a lot of authority, per se. He exercises a lot of muscular power, but as a living symbol, he, in our diocese, is what, one of the things we all have in common. We all have this relationship with this one person um, whose job is to live a sacramental life. And when it's good and power is not abused in that, there's a real beauty in that, a real sheer beauty um, in it. And that's that's just what we try to do. We don't always get it right, but we, we get it right a lot of times. And, and uh, yeah. That's the first I've heard of alignment with the, uh, the government thing yeah. on how it's set up. And now it makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it's, once you see it, it's undeniably sensible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, an exact, almost exact parallel. Andrew, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. That was indulgent. That was fun for me. So I'm glad. I'm glad it was of some benefit to y'all. Okay. Yeah. You can hang that back up. Thank you guys. Yeah, the little lamb. Bye, y'all. Bye.